Hello, and welcome back to day two of the Strong Start to Finish Learning Network Convening. I hope everybody is excited about the day as I am. I certainly was motivated and energized by all the great discussions we had yesterday, including the charge to really lean into Big L leadership by President Sorrell. We're excited for today's program, which includes our opening keynote from Dr. Estella Ben-Simone, two concurrent breakout session times where we can dive deeper into some of the key themes of our network's activities, and a closing session where I'll have a chance to introduce and conduct a brief conversation with our new director of the Strong Start to Finish initiative. As we get underway, just a couple of quick notes. First, I know yesterday we had a couple of small technical challenges with some of you that were using Safari as a browser. We believe those have been corrected overnight, but please reach out and let us know if you continue to have any difficulties. I also want to remind you that we have a section of time in the agenda today for connecting with peers and colleagues. Please just check out the networking section of our event platform and schedule some time to connect with someone you might not have talked to in a while. As I mentioned yesterday, and as a reminder, we're very grateful for you that able to keep on your video as often as possible, which just really supports the engagement that we can have in these sessions. And I wanna invite you to continue to share what you're learning via social at the hashtag SSTFLNC21 and to access the resources that are available for the concurrent sessions and keynotes that you'll hear from today, also available on the event platform. It's now my pleasure to introduce Molly Sarubi, a senior project manager on the Strong Start to Finish team, who will welcome our day two keynote speaker. Molly, over to you. Thank you, Brian, and hello, everyone. I echo Brian's sentiments of gratitude for you all joining us today, and I'm very pleased to introduce our next plenary session and speaker. As University Professor Emerita and founding director of the Center for Urban Education at USC, and now the director of Ben Simone and Associates, Dr. Estella Ben Simone demonstrates a lifelong professional and academic commitment to normalizing racial equity. Known for developing the equity scorecard and defining the term equity-minded, Estella continues to push for policy reform and transformation of institutional practice in campus culture. She challenges the status quo and calls for the dismantling of structures that perpetuate inequities. Today, we thank her for her time and tremendous expertise in her keynote address, dismantling the academy's version of redlining, remedial education. As she shares her remarks, please use the chat feature to pose questions for Estella. So without further ado, Estella, the virtual stage is yours. Thank you very much, Molly. And uh, thank you, Brian, also for inviting me to do this keynote in this very important meeting. Uh, I am going to uh, start sharing my screen and, uh, and uh, explaining the, um, the title of my <clears throat> presentation. So let us see if this is working, hopefully. All right, everyone hopefully can see that. And uh, so you may be wondering uh, wh what is redlining? Or those of you who know about redlining uh, are probably wondering what does it have to do with remedial education? So, uh, in, during the Great Depression, the, uh, the federal government went into the business of assessing riskiness in, um, <clears throat> on uh, loans for, uh, for buying homes. And uh, so they developed this uh, system of color coding cities, neighborhoods, according to their, uh, their racial makeup. And the term redlining comes from the ways in which um, black neighborhoods were coded. They were coded as being the most risky for uh, home loans. And, um, and I'll show you what it looked like in this next slide. So here's the map of New Orleans. And as you can see, all of those red colors uh, signify predominantly black neighborhoods. And the, the consequences of, of redlining were that um, Black families uh, were not eligible for the uh, federal housing 
loans, which, uh, which were at the time what most people then were using to buy, uh, to, 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 you know, to buy homes. The, uh, and the reason for this uh, redlining was that it was to protect whites from incomp incomp incompatible racial groups. So the, the consequences of redlining are that high segregation also resulted in poorly resourced schools. And, um, and you can trace a line from redlining to now and you know, the, the, whole, you know, the whole business of remedial education. Redlining also made it impossible for Blacks to develop equity and wealth. So today, Blacks have 5% of the wealth held uh, by whites. So in the 1960s, following uh, World War II uh, and the Truman Report, as well as the 1964 Civil Rights Act, higher education had its own racial reckoning and, um, and made, opened up access to higher education for racially minoritized students. And so you see places like the City University of New York with open enrollment. In California, the master plan resulted in the expansion of the community college system. But the reason why I'm describing remedial education as the Academy's red version of redlining is because with open access also came ways of coding students in terms of being college ready. And uh, so here you see the Accuplace there, which I have next to a map of Camden, New Jersey. And this result, even though, yes, white students were also placed into uh, remedial education courses, the fact is that it had the most disproportionate impact on Blacks and Latinx. In many ways, remedial education has been a subtractive uh, practice for, for racially minoritized students. So, um, and essentially prevented them from earning degrees because there were so many layers, so many courses in the sequence of, rem sequence of remedial education courses that for most students, they, they went nowhere. So here you see um, a contemporary data so for every 100 students, uh, Latinx, Hispanic, who start college, 50 are enrolled in math remediation. And for Blacks, uh, for every 100 Black students, 61 are enrolled in math remediation. So you can see here the, um, the great impact of, um, of, of remedial education and why I am calling it the Academy's redlining version. So now we are, you know, in, in the 60s, uh, we passed the Fair Housing Act to eliminate redlining. And, um, and now higher education, after almost 50 years of remedial education, is moving towards its elimination. And of course, ECS, Strong Start to Finish, is one of the leaders of the movement. And what I'd like to say is that this is an opportunity for us to not make the same mistakes of the past. So I think of the, uh, the movement to uh, eliminate remedial education as corrective justice, corrective justice for the wrongs done over the last 50 years by placing racially minoritized students in uh, non-credit remedial education courses. I also think about the elimination of remedial education as an anti-racist project, kind of following the, um, the thinking and the writing of Ibram X. Candy. And I also have to say that in order for the elimination of remedial education to truly be an anti-racist project, we have to find ways of decentering whiteness in the, um, in, in the reforms that we are um, advocating for. So in order to be able to think about 
the reform of remedial education or its elimination as corrective justice, as anti-racist, and as a means to decenter whiteness, we have some obstacles to overcome. One of those obstacles is race aversive, race neutral, and racially biased mental schemas. And I'm gonna talk about what that means. We have to also overcome the obstacle of white-centered funds of knowledge. And lastly, we have to come to terms that race-neutral structural approaches to reform are not sufficient. So mental schema. When I look at much of the reform literature, often it talks about all students. And, uh, and this is the myth of universalism discussed in Robin DeAngelo's book on uh, white uh, fragility. So the myth of universalism is that we just say all students. But the problem is that when we say all students, we're always really thinking, we imagine all students is always white students. So in order for, uh, we need for the reform to be advantageous to racially minoritized students, we have to be much more specific in our language, as well as in the ways in which we talk about data. So if core requisites are having a positive impact, we need to think about are they having a positive impact for Black students, for Latinx students, for Indigenous students, for Native Hawaiian students, for Pacific Islanders, and so on. We have to train ourselves to, to speak in, in specifics rather than in universalists that continue to center whiteness. Another mental schema that we have to um, overcome is the idea that we claim that we do not see um, that we do not see race. I often hear this from faculty when we work with uh, college campuses on the implementation of the equity scorecard and its tools. So I will hear things like, "This has nothing to do with with race. I teach students. You know, I don't care whether they're white, black, or purple." Uh, and then maybe these students are just not ready for college, but it has nothing to do with race. So we have to learn how to turn around that and say, ask ourselves or have our, uh, our instructors ask, you know, where do you see racial representation in your syllabi? So if you look at syllabi, whether it's math or English or other um, disciplines, often, you will see that Black people, Latinx people are missing from those syllabi. Um, you can also ask, where do you see racialization in classroom participation? So rather than not saying, I don't see race, it is important to look at by race and ethnicity, who in the classroom is participating, who is engaged, and maybe who has stopped coming to class. And then finally, seeing race in data reports. Although we talk about the, um, the segregation of, of data by race and ethnicity, I still see in lots of places uh, data aggregated and where you can really don't see what the, um, what the disparities might be. I also sometimes see that racially minoritized students are aggregated into the category of underrepresented minorities, URNs, and uh, which of course hides the differences between Black, Latinx, Indigenous, Asian Americans, and so forth. So another obstacle is the, uh, the, the blaming of the students for their, um, for, for their performance. So, you know, just say, they, you know, they just aren't prepared, they're not going to succeed. You know, here in California, we have passed AB 705, which is elimination of remedial education in the community colleges. And there has been a great deal of resistance to uh, implementing the legislation because of just the idea that the students are not ready and they're not going to, to succeed. Um, even the academic senate, the statewide academic senate for the California community colleges has been very resistant to the reform. Um, 
the things like in, the, in, in syllabi I have seen, if you cannot dedicate at least two hours of study for each hour of class, you should drop the course. This is again, assuming that students don't have the motivation and therefore should not be in the course. Or I tell students to go see a tutor, but they don't go. So the mental schema that often is um, that it is activated when when faculty and others see data that show racial disparities is to think about what is um, missing or what the student is not doing. So I am suggesting that the alternative or, or, the, or the mental schema that we need to develop is one that asks questions of ourselves. You know, why are we more successful with white students? Why are prerequisites more successful with white students? Why is it that all of our math faculty are white? How might we be creating subtractive educational experience for Latinx students? In other words, that the mental schema that we have always focused on students, we need to turn that around and develop mental schema that interrogates our own practices. So the second obstacle that I mentioned was um, the, cent the, the white centeredness in the scholarship that we rely on to, um, to, to, to understand the reforms and to understand remedial education. And I'm always surprised that I never see in much of the uh, of documents related to the reform of uh, remedial education, the work of scholars of color. So this is, of course, you know, uh, Dr. Maxine Roberts, because she is um, affiliated, she's uh, on the staff at ECS. And, um, and she wrote uh, this article, which is a wonderful article. And because it's a wonderful article because it's not about failure. It's about black students who actually are successful in mathematics, despite, despite having to experience microaggressions and lower expectations from faculty. I rarely ever see this article cited, or I'm not even sure that people are aware of it. Here is another article by uh, Nancy Acevedo Hill and all of her um, uh, co-authors, which is about um, uh, Latinos in community college developmental education and the notion of interpersonal validation. It's a concept that was coined by Laura Rendon, which is the importance of recognizing students' assets and and, and validating them by, by either bringing them into the classroom or by acknowledging them. And here is um, the, all of these scholars, all of them actually are scholars of math education in both K through 12 and higher education. And I think that they are pretty much unknown uh, in the reform movement for, um, for uh, remedial education. So what I am suggesting is that these scholars bring a different perspective into teaching, into remedial math, remedial English, and its elimination. And that by not drawing on their work, we are really missing something very, very important. And, and the problem is that by not uh, being familiar with these scholars and drawing on their work, we are reforming remedial education from a white perspective only. Um, so the next obstacle is that structural change is not enough to overcome you know, power, pedagogical barriers, and, 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 and the mindsets. And by structural change, I mean that it's not enough to think about the reform movement as the uh, elimination of remedial education, the placement of students directly into college level courses and, uh, and supporting them with core requisite courses. That, that is very necessary, uh, you know, absolutely, but it is, it's not enough to overcome the, um, the great disparities that we see in our outcomes. And so in order to do that, we have to recognize that faculty members uh, who are teaching these courses are first generation equity practitioners. 
So we talk about first generation students, but in here I'm turning that around and talking about faculty as first generation equity practitioners. And this is a term coined by James Gray, who is uh, a math instructor at the Community College of Aurora in Colorado. And, and we have an article in Change Magazine talking about this. But um, so I'm going to talk next about a, a first generation equity practitioner. His name is Jason Berg. He is a math professor at the Community College of Denver. Uh, Jason participated in a project that we did in Colorado's community colleges for over one year, which consisted of a series of, um, of labs where the, um, the, the, the participating faculty were introduced to tools that enabled them to study their own practices. So um, one of the one of the theories behind our work is that typically, you know, we, we, we have this best practices model. We see data, we see gaps, and we create solutions. And uh, what I am suggesting here is that what we need to do first is we cannot just jump into solutions without really knowing what the causes are of the disparity. And the tools that we introduced in Colorado, which uh, were several, were specifically to involve people like Jason Berg in the study of what was going on in his classroom. So one of those tools was the grade book. So what I'm showing you here is how we taught the faculty to code their grade book so instead of the, the column, instead of the names, what you have is the racial and ethnic um, identity of the students. And the symbols are for, uh, for submission of assignments, the homework, for attendance, for grades and quizzes and tests and so forth. And the purpose of this gradebook mapping is to be able to see racialization in the classroom. And what I'm going to show you next is how this worked um, for Jason. So please, please listen carefully because then afterwards, I'm hoping that we can talk maybe in the chat um, feature about what you heard here and I will also go over it. That's 65.4%. Uh, this is my college algebra. Um, that's maybe like an average success in college algebra. But it doesn't really kind of show really or reflect the successes of minoritized students. So once we uh, get the disaggregated data, which we weren't um, able to look at before this, now all of a sudden I can see, oh, wow. So that's 64%, actually 65% compromises mainly white students being successful and Latinx students being not as successful. So I start to think, huh. I've not really thought about minoritized students before and their success within my classes. I just thought that maybe um, students come to my class, they are either successful, they're not successful, are they putting the work in, are they dropping out of class early? But I haven't thought about who or, or who was kind of just not been as successful as other students. Instead of just going through a syllabus, here's how we do the homework, here's where you go to look at how to get to the classroom uh, material. Um, let's just teach, teach a little lesson. We all go home and that's the first day. It's very instructive driven. It can be and that's what it used to be in the past. So I tried to turn this around to it being more student driven that first day. So I think that now this is a big turnaround in so much as uh, my Latinx students that they're, they're staying in the class, they're being successful, they're doing the homework, they're all part of the class, they're responding, they're talking in class, they're, they're working with each other, they're working with other students. And I feel as though they, they do feel as though uh, they're now almost like at the front of the class, not hidden at the back of the class. It may be that I, because I wasn't following, well, I wasn't talking to the students, I wasn't getting to know them, weren't getting to know me, that they were dropping from the class. And therefore, you know, that shows that a lower success rate for the Latinx students. Um, whereas now you can see that um, I've got a large percent that are successful. Uh, they are now as successful as my white students. And I think it's because I am talking to them. They are feeling part of the class. Um, I am talking one-on-one, -on -one. we're working together a lot more. They're not just some student that I don't get to know and maybe drops out of their class after five weeks or isn't being as successful. This success 
like I say, it does reflect the Q mindset, this equity mindset we've been working on. And also, um, you can't go back. Once you've done this, it is a way to um, talk to other instructors about. These, these aren't hard steps to take in the classroom. Little things about talking one-on-one with your students, maybe starting a little bit of homework in the classroom, helping them within the classroom. Uh, first day activities. It's not just you at the front, students there, and it's all you, all you, all you. This mindset has changed the way I look at my students, the way I teach, the way I approach my teaching. And as you can see, it has been very successful this past year. So I'd always like to thank the Q team for, for uh, helping us and be a part of this. And it's something that I can now pass on to um, other instructors. That's uh, 65. So um, here are some of the things that, uh, that Jason said. Um, one was about data. He mentioned that he had never been given data by race and ethnicity for his courses. So this is a practice that I think you know, would be, it's, it's a very good practice to do if it's facilitated. Uh, if it's facilitated, well, you can just give the data. Um, he also uh, realized that he had never thought about minoritized students in his, uh, in his class. And that doing the grade book mapping you know, made him aware of it. He also became aware of how instructor driven the class was and, and he made changes to, um, to make it more, uh, more of a shared partnership between him and the students. Uh, he talks about the Latinx students who are no longer at the back. Uh, they are now at the front of the classroom. And, and this is a very short uh, video from a much longer video where he talks much more expansively about all these changes. Um, he talks about letting the students getting to know him. The other practice that he started was uh, starting the homework in class so that the students could see that they could get it done. For, Latinx students who their success rate was 33%. One of the problems was that they came to class, but um, they were not submitting the homework. And then he also talks about passing on his learning to his, um, to his colleagues. The point is that some of you may have thought, well, that's a really small class and you know, we need to think at scale, right? But just think, if every instructor at the Community College of Denver, um, and they're now working on this, did what Jason did, just imagine what the outcomes could be. So my point here is that it's not enough for Jason to now be teaching college level math with a prerequisite, but he also had to change himself. And one of the ways in which you bring about self change is through the um, through by engaging practitioners in in with tools like the one the one I showed you, so that they can see how their practices are in fact disadvantaging the students um, non white students. Um, I am going to um, check on the time, or maybe Molly can just jump in and tell me how we are doing, and um, so that we have time for um, for questions. Um, and I am not seeing the chat, so I don't know them, whether there are questions. Yes, yeah, so um, Stella, you're yeah. do, you're doing great. We have a few questions that we can hold towards the end, but you want to. Um, you know, share a few more remarks uh, over the next five to seven minutes, we should be good. Okay, the other, um, what I wanted to also say is that in the project in Colorado, we also observed the class. So it wasn't just enough for Jason and, and, and his, we had maybe 40 other faculty members from uh, the other community colleges to study their own practices. We also observed their, their classes and we would provide each instructor with a feedback memo where we would share with them, you know, what we observe from a, a racial equity perspective. So here's just as an example of a memo that we would provide each of the instructors. And again, this is also an important practice. Um, hold on, uh, Los Angeles is picking up garbage and it's very noisy. 
Um, and um, in, in our Q equity tools, which I think we made available, the link, the, the observation protocol is available. And this is something that can also be done um, by department chairs or faculty peers one to another. Another tool that we develop is the syllabus review tool. And, and the reason why we did this is because the, we noticed that syllabi were tended to be um, very rules minded, um, very dry, um, uh, always written in the third person, very, you know, yeah, very impersonal. So the syllabus review tool that we created has these six elements. And again, you can find that in the website and you can apply it to your own to syllabi in a department, you can do it as a group, you can do it as individuals. And what I was going to show you was just one example of one of the faculty members who looked at her syllabus using our tool and how she um, translated the welcoming aspect by creating um, a video. Oops, I hope this one plays. Um, it played before, sorry. Uh, let's see. Okay, I don't think that this is going to. So I'm not going to play it, but what it is, is it's a video. Oops. This is the canoe that a young couple will get gloriously lost okay, in together. Okay, let's see, how do I stop this? Um, this is the checkers game where grandson and granddad will bond. Okay, These let me just see what's happening here. Mother. She's nervous about starting a new school. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, this is what happens with um, doing things uh, in Zoom. So anyway, what I was going to say is that what she did is she created a video which she sends to her students and tells them about the course and, uh, and welcomes them. And also during the pandemic, you know, shares with them that she understands, you know, what a difficult time this is. It's a wonderful video and I'm sorry that I cannot show it to you. Um, so let me go on. She also, what she did in her syllabus, the notion of representing, right? So uh, representing in, in the syllabus, the works of black, Latinx, indigenous um, artists, scholars, um, and uh, popular artists. So in this one, what she did was uh, she gave her class an assignment where they read the, the, the uh, an excerpt from Grit. I'm sure you're all familiar with the book because Grit has become like a trendy thing. And, um, and often we don't realize that Grit can be another version of the bootstrap theory. So what she does is she also provides a video to Bettina Love's um, talk about student success among black students and gives them an assignment to compare grit with Bettina Love's um, uh, talk. So another tool that we use is around data. So oftentimes faculty like Jason get, you know, they see big data. But in order for him to be able to take action, he needs to see small data. He needs to see the data for his own classroom. And we created a formula that it enables faculty to actually calculate how many more African-American students, how many more Latinx students would need to be successful in my class in order for me to close the equity gaps. So um, I'm going to... Um, uh, I'm going to skip this and I'm going to go to, um, to this and wrap up. So what I'm saying is that in order for the reform of remedial education to be corrective justice, to achieve its anti-racist potential, and to decenter whiteness in the reform, we can actually begin to study our practices. And here are the ways in which we can do that. We, create, we can create maps of the practice, we can review the documents associated with the, um, with, with the instruction, whether it's the syllabus, but also other kinds of documents. 
and uh, you can do observations, you can interview people, and, um, and you can review data that's close to practice, a term coined by Alicia Dowd, such as the one that I have shown you. So the, um, my closing comment on all of this is that we need to right now consider how we're going about the reform and are we centering the reform in the lives and experiences and needs of racially minoritized students. Otherwise, the reform can become just as harmful as what we have done for the last 50 years with remedial education. Thank you very much. I'm really sorry that I cannot see you and um, I hope that I can answer some questions. So let me bring this to an end and I will take this off the um, screen. Thank you so, so much, Stella. That was wonderful. We do have a couple of questions that came in from the chat that relate to a few of your talking points. Uh, one topic of discussion that came up is the role of faculty who are obviously super important to this work. So can you say a little bit about um, you know, how they have responded to uh, this push and this challenge for a student-centered student approach and, um, you know, how you continue to incentivize them and increase stakeholder buy-in from the faculty perspective. Yeah, um, so one of the reasons why we have been successful with faculty is because we are not really imposing anything on them we are providing them with the tools where they become the drivers of their own investigation. And so like Jason, you know, he said, I never thought about these things, and, but I'm never going back now. And so that is just so important, but I only showed you Jason. If you go to our website, you will see other faculty members we have worked with. So I guess what I would say is that when you impose a curriculum on faculty, uh, then it becomes more problematic. And I'm not, not to say that all faculty love this. Uh, you know, there's some faculty we will never convince, but um, I think that there are enough, like Jason, who can make a difference. And um, it's important because most of the faculty, like Jason, are white. And so they're first equity practitioners who need to learn how to become equity minded, meaning race conscious. You're muted. Yes, thank you. I think that's so important to acknowledge the role that faculty play and to bring them along, uh, you know, in ways that we can uh, for this work. Um, you know, one last question as we wrap up quickly, uh, which is maybe a bigger question than we can answer right now, um, is how do you recommend navigating, you know, sometimes difficult conversations with educators to interrogate and examine unintended racist effects? So whether they be overt or covert, uh, for our audience, how do you, uh, any tips and tricks for them to get those, those hard conversations started? to more intentionally address racial equity? Yeah, so, okay. So one of the things is that we have to understand that they're difficult conversations for white people. Um, they are not necessarily difficult conversations for, uh, for racially minoritized people because one way or another, they have to experience those conversations every single day. Um, and so I think that we need to be direct and um, oftentimes we skirt around race and my, I, I, you know what, I never think of them as difficult conversations. I think of them as conversations that we have to have and that when we avoid them, that's what the problem is. Um, and so I have been uh, always very upfront about my focus on racial equity um, for 20 years. Uh, when I started doing this work, nobody would talk about equity. I was warned not to talk about it. And I always say, well, finally, I think the rest caught up with me. 
So now the danger is that everybody's talking about equity uh, without any kind of definition or, or grounding in essentially in critical race theory. So what I'm calling for, and that was the reason why I spoke about corrective justice, anti-racism and decentering whiteness. I would say that much of the reform movement right now is white centered and it, we can't do that. It's not going to address the problem. Well, thank you so much. As always, you know, you push us and remind us that while reforms have made some successes, there's still much more work to be done to uh, decentralize whiteness and focus on racial equity. Uh, so that does bring us to time. Of All course, right. there, is way, there are ways to get in touch with Estella via the platform. And uh, we hope to continue this important conversation in one of our upcoming concurrence. Thank you.